before I make a start, I'm just going to go over some housekeeping rules um, so we can make sure we have a, a full um, and um, productive discussion today in the hour that we have together. Um, firstly, everybody's microphones will be on mute. Um, given the weight of interest in the discussion, um, when we first put it on, it sold out um, within 24 hours. So we had to get new licenses and that sold out now as well. So it's certainly tapping into a lot of interest. But we just make sure that um, everybody's on mute. So we, it's the only way you can really manage um, the call today um, to make sure we don't get a lot of distraction of background noise. Um, but we do want this to be interactive as an event. Um, and so we do urge everybody to use the chat throughout. Um, you can start using it straight away. Just introduce who you are um, and what you're interested is, is in today's discussion. Um, but most importantly, if you could use the chat to post questions or, or observations or ideas or links to things that you think are useful and relevant um, to the discussion as it goes through today. Um, we'll make sure that we get as many of the questions um, put to the panel as possible during the hours um, session today. But even if we um, aren't able to cover every question that gets posted, we will definitely make sure that we save and record them. Um, and it gives us um, information that we can then use um, following the event and make sure we get all the, the key themes and key points and, and, and questions covered um, either today or, or in the materials that we send uh, later. Um, should you have any technical problems, um, or hopefully we won't, um, but you can never be sure um, to avoid that. Um, what I would say is that if, um, you, if your screen or your sound gets affected at any point during the day, then do leave and try and rejoin. Um, but if there's any problem at our end of the technical side of things, then we'll make that clear um, so that um, not everybody has, leaves at once. Um, and finally, can um, ask everybody to be respectful and considerate in the chat um, to each other's thoughts and opinions and, and seek to sort of build positively on what other people have said. And if you like what somebody said or agree with them, then, then indicate that and, and give encouragement. Um, and I think that we'll have a very productive and, and thoroughly enjoyable um, thought provoking session um, this afternoon. So today we have three um, distinguished speakers. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you. Um, so you have Dr. Anna Dixon, MBE, um, Kenton Farkerson, MBE, and Kate Sibthorpe um, as well, each of whom bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise to this conversation and discussion. Um, and I'm personally looking very much looking forward to hearing their thoughts and perspectives um, on the topic. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand the reins over to Dr. Um, Anna Dixon, MBE, who's going to introduce you, first of all, to the key points from her report. Thank Hi you, there Anna. and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Ian, and um, delighted to be doing this joint uh, webinar with TLAP today following the launch of the Archbishop's uh, Commission on Reimagining Care report. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Anna Dixon. Um, as I say, I was chair of the commission alongside my co-chair, um, the Bishop of Carlisle, James Newcomb, and alongside uh, some brilliant commissioners, including Clinton. So I'm really delighted uh, to be back in conversation with Clinton. We've had some brilliant um, discussions and debates as a commission, and I hope that uh, those thoughts and that thoughtfulness is reflected in the findings of our report, which I'd really like to share with you um, today. So um, one of the colleagues from TLAP is gonna be putting up some slides, hopefully now, um, which I'm just going to briefly take you through to give you a flavor um, of the work we did and the main recommendations and conclusions that we have reached. So the Archbishops of Canterbury and York commissioned this. So if we go to the next slide, um, back in April uh, 2021. So um, we've been working for about 18 months as a commission. And for the first part of that, we were very keen to listen. And so we spent quite a lot of time listening to and engaging with people who both draw on care and support and their family uh, and carers. And it's really uh, that together with uh, the theological thinking that has informed our work. So we were tasked with coming up with a radical vision for care and support in England. And uh, we hope it is radical in places. I think given that there's been so many reports over so many years, it's sometimes hard to come up with new and radical ideas. But we started from a very different place than the previous report. So many reports start with the question of funding. Who's gonna pay? 
how how much is this all going to cost and in a way we get stuck on that don't we and uh fail to really move on so <clears throat> by starting with uh, beliefs uh and values we started by thinking about values such as loving kindness mutuality trust I guess words and concepts that don't often get talked about in policy debates, but yet are so central to care and support, um, that love for one another. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, the listening was a key part of it, and we did that through organisations with partner organisations, uh, as well as a survey. And, uh, and we chose to publish that part way through because we felt it was really important to share publicly at that stage what we had heard so far. We then uh, built on that in our deliberations and were quite open in the way that we evolved our recommendations. We had a virtual summit um, and we met with um, lots of different stakeholders to test out our thinking. Throughout this and when COVID uh, restrictions allowed, we also did visits uh, to a really wide range of settings um, from uh, shared lives um, up in North Yorkshire to community-based uh, support in churches uh, and community centres. Next slide, please. Perhaps not surprising that, you know, when asked about how things were now, um, we heard quite a lot of negative things. People said, you know, that care is very complex, it's difficult to navigate. We definitely heard from unpaid carers and care workers that they were exhausted and stretched. Uh, too many people in need of care and support said that it was a fight to get what they needed and many were not getting uh, the care and support that they felt they needed to live a good life. Let's go to the next slide. But in amongst that, we did also hear positives, uh, you know, where communities, including church and faith communities, were doing an amazing job of providing uh, informal support and opportunities for people to contribute. We did hear and met some of the proactive local authorities that are really uh, investing in and believe in community-led uh, initiatives. And of course, throughout, we heard from all sorts of people about the amazing support that they get from their family carers and their um, care workers or personal assistants uh, to provide them with support. And um, here you can see Debbie, who is one of the people we spoke to from Livability, uh, from their future forum. And uh, at our launch last week, we had a great video of them talking about the ways in which support enables them to live a good life. And I'd recommend you might have a look at that on the website. Can we go to the next slide, please. So um, from all of this, uh, we've put forward a vision of care, which is really about defining care and support as enabling people to flourish and live a full life. Uh, that gives access to and funding of care that's universal and fair, that reflects the values of loving kindness and empathy, and where society and churches are inclusive of all people. And finally, where care and support promotes mutuality, recognising that it's a give and take and that it's based on trust. So that's our vision. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. To realise that vision, we've made three high level recommendations. The first is rethinking attitudes. The second is rebalancing roles and responsibilities. And the third, which we're going to spend most time in the discussion on today, is redesigning the system. If we go to the next slide, please. We put rethinking attitudes first because we felt that one of the main reasons that political priority had not been given to this issue and the reason as a society why we haven't uh, priorities prioritised and valued care and support is because of firstly our, our attitude and understanding of care and support but allied to that are our negative attitudes to ageing and to disability and this was the topic of a webinar we had uh, this week with Social Care Futures thinking about how we could bring together a broad social movement to really campaign and help to shift the culture and attitudes towards care and support. Next slide please. The second area, this rebalancing roles and responsibilities, our central idea here was the development of a national care covenant. And why a care covenant and not a care service or a care contract? Because a covenant is about mutual responsibilities. It's something that is about promises to one another. It's about trust and an agreement. And so we feel that that's what's needed, that we have an 
deep public dialogue about our roles and responsibilities as national and local government, as communities, as families, and as individuals and citizens. And that that should then set out very clearly and simply for everybody uh, exactly what they can expect to get and what they are uh, expected to give. And within this, what we would like to see and hope that there will be in that settlement uh, empowering communities and by that we mean that communities are already doing so much but it's really important that that support is available to everyone everywhere and that means that particularly local authorities but others need to be investing in communities and we are calling also on the church to invest in local church communities so that they're better equipped and better able to support people we want a new deal from paid carers and there's lots of detail in there about what that means in practice but it's really fundamental that we want to restore loving relationships we heard about people's relationships that were strained they'd become carers and they wanted to be mothers and daughters fathers husbands and for that end we've said really very fundamentally that the decision to give care to a loved one should be a voluntary choice, a voluntary choice both for the person who draws on care support and the person giving it. And that where people take on a substantial part of care that would otherwise fall to the state, that they should provide them with the financial, practical and emotional support. Uh, and we talk about Sabbath and the need for restorative rest, um, which I think is very important. So underpinning all of this, we do see a stronger role for the state, but not in providing everything but for upholding rights, making sure that communities and unpaid carers and people who draw on care and support, you know, get those services without a fight. So a much stronger uh, framework and consistent national framework. Underpinning this though too are our responsibilities as engaged citizens, and that means as taxpayers, we do put forward the idea that this should be collectively funded. We think the costs at the moment fall too much to individuals. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, so that'll all be encaptured in a national care covenant. So this third area, just to finish on before we uh, move into conversation, was this idea that really what we heard was that this is, system is not working. It's not working for anybody at the moment. And therefore, we can't just tinker around the edges, but we do need to radically redesign it. And fundamental to this redesign is just to make sure it is simple, consistent, and person-centred and we know that through the work that TLAP's done and your real statements and your work on um, looking at how to change direct payments to realise the CARE Act in terms of self-directed support this is something that you're already doing lots of great work on but we looked at, at other countries and we're proposing that the processes of assessment uh, uh, and effectively determining the resources should be separated from care planning at the moment, social workers are rationers, gatekeepers, um, and we think that um, that assessment process should be carer blind. It should be very simple and people should be allocated a budget on the basis of their, um, their, their level of disability. And then people should be trusted to manage their own care and decide what support they need. If they need it, they should have access to independent advocacy uh, to, to help them get their rights and entitlements. And if they don't want to manage the budget themselves, we already have the individual service funds, they should be able to give it to somebody else to manage for them. And within this, we also think that we need to redesign workforce roles. There's lots in our report and others about the pay and conditions of, of care workers. And we do think those are necessary, but we also need in looking to the future, think about how we get the best of what we have in personal assistance, um, and uh, redesign roles for care workers so that they work for people who draw on care and support, but also are satisfying jobs and allow workers to do to deliver the care that they went into the profession uh, to deliver. So those are our sort of like headlines, and um, I look forward in the conversation to get into a little bit more detail about how this redesign system would work in terms of putting people uh, right at the centre of their care and and realizing i think that uh, vision that people be trusted and um empowered through this process so if we could stop um the slides there thank you very much 
Thank you, Anna. That's an excellent introduction and to what is a very full and thorough report. That's a really helpful, useful summary for today's discussion. Thank you. Um, we're now going to go into the next, um, which is the, one of the, the main parts of today's um, webinar, which is a, a, a discussion and a conversation between Anna, um, Clinton and, and Kate. And Clinton is chair of TLAP, um, but is also, as Anna said, a commissioner on the report as well of, of the commission um, and to fed directly into the drafting of the report and Kate Sibthorpe who is co-chair um, with Isaac Samuels of the National Co-Production Advisory Group who work very closely with TLAP um, but also a family carer for her daughter as well um, and Anna's going to sort of introduce some questions for a discussion um, and just before we get into that just to thank everybody for the the comments and chats that um, are, are going in um, so it's good that you've all found that and you're using that um, do make sure when you listen to the conversation and um, between Anna Clinton and, 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 and Kate um, that any thoughts or ideas and, and questions for the, the second half of the webinar, um, do make sure you keep posting them in the chat as well. Okay, um, so over to you, Anna. Great. Well, I, I think maybe if it's okay, I'll turn to you first, Kate. I mean, you obviously have had chance not only to hear me speak today, but um, to, to actually have a look at the report and and. Uh, read some of what it says um, about how things need to change. So what what did you make of it, um, particularly as a, as a family carer? Yeah, thanks, Anna. So um, I'd just like to share with people that um, I'm mum to a young woman who is just over 30 and she has uh, learning disabilities and she's autistic. So that's sort of my lived experience of the system, really. And I live in Cheshire, in case there's anyone else from... Uh, Cheshire on the call. Um, so for me, I, I really um, love the report. I think that um, as a society, we don't currently have a really good view of what social care is. So, you know, the current narrative is all about its role in relieving pressure on the NHS. Um, and it should be much more, it is much more than that. So for me, as a family carer, the whole report and the listening process that underpinned it, um, it just felt as if a, a kind and empathetic friend has said to me, I see you and I see how challenging life can be sometimes. So can we sit down and talk so that I can understand what's happening for you um, and what I can do to make things better? So I really hope that the report will bring more people into the conversation um, about how we can reimagine social care. That's fantastic, Kate, and very touching, to be honest, as, as chair of the commission. Um, we really did try from the beginning to make sure that we um, we we listened uh, to to your experiences, to others like you, um, and uh, reflect that in 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 a in a way that hopefully is um, yeah is encouraging and hopeful. I think that was yeah. a word that came for us a lot was hope. Um, you know, I think we're being challenged now. How do we make this a reality? And that's absolutely right. But, but part of this is actually making visible your stories and, and making visible, um, you know, what is going on day to day for people in their, in their homes and um, why that needs to be different. So, so thanks for that, Kate. Clinton, you're obviously on the inside, but you also have a role as chair of, of, of TLAP and have been working on these issues. Um, do you feel that, you know, we, we're moving the debate on? Do you, do you have hope this time uh, where other reports have maybe sat and uh, gathered dust or the, the latest phrase is, is everything gets kicked into the long grass. So how do we stop that happening? Um, as a, um... Firstly, as a commissioner and as a person who draws on care and support, um, I, I um, really welcome the, uh, the call for such reimagining uh, towards, you know, um, a, the goal of uh, flourishing for all and renew uh, focus on, for me, self-directed support and a major effort to shift public uh, attitudes to underpin that change and rebalancing the role and responsibility uh, through um, introducing the National Care Covenant. Uh, but also for me, in the conversation and the report, using words like love, you know, isn't um, really associated with social care 
And for me, uh, hope is just as important as love. So, you know, uh, having both connected in the space of talking around uh, social care to me is refreshing. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, Clinton. And thank you for your contributions. You know, um, it was a great collaborative effort. We, we had some great uh, discussions uh, when, when we met both virtually and, and in person. Um, obviously, at the moment, the system very much seems to be built around this idea of sort of dependency, um, you know, delivering services to people, um, thinking really about assessing their, their need uh, in quite a reductionist way. Uh, people talked about the bureaucracy of assessment. So we have a system that's, I guess, you know, th th those are some of the things, the language that's used, the approach. Uh, we know it's not necessarily what social workers want to be doing, but that that is sort of how how um, how it is for them. How how do we turn that around? You know, we say we want a radical redesign. So, what's it going to take to turn that around so that it's actually built on people's hopes and aspirations and delivers on this idea that we've put forward of enabling people to flourish? You know, live an abundant life. And um, what are your thoughts on that, Kate? What's it going to take? So, yeah, absolutely. I just say my relationship with my social worker is completely under that cloud of how much it costs to support my daughter. So it means I have a very poor relationship with my local social worker. I don't trust her um, to have my daughter's best interests at heart. Um, I do see her purely as a gatekeeper. Um, when actually I'd rather she was there to be alongside me and figure out how to get um, the best life for my daughter. So for me, that the idea in the report of separating the assessment and the care planning process sounds like a really interesting and brilliant idea. So I'm hoping that from today, you know, as, as things progress, um, we can have some really uh, more in-depth conversations and explorations of how that can happen without losing state responsibility for making sure that people have the support that they need because that's really critical and that's part of us for me as a society you know taking care of each other mm -hmm. you know the state has it is that rebalancing of roles um yeah and I think I use the term it's a bit jargon care of blind so this is another I think seems fairly radical so two people you know objectively having the same need uh, somebody like your daughter but, you know, in one situation, parent like yourself, perhaps visible, seem to be available to provide care. So actually you get less um, than the other. So the idea that somehow, you know, your initial sort of um, what you're entitled to is, is not so dependent on the availability of care. And therefore, then the care planning discussion that follows is much more about so what where could you draw this care from? Where would you like to draw this care from? Who in your community or who in your family could actually help with some of this and wants to, rather than the, the sort of assumptions being made? How, how do you think that could work? Or have you any experience of, of that, um, either negatively or positively at the moment? Yeah, see, I, I would say that's how things should already be happening. So that's, it's actually in the Care Act legislation that assessments of care are blind. So you're meant to sit down and work out what people's needs are um, without, um, without support from anybody. And then you then can have a conversation with the person and the family and friends and communities about, you know, where can we get the support that you need, exactly as you described. Like to me, there's nothing to stop local authorities from taking that approach now. It's exactly what they should be doing. Um, but I think all too often it's easier if you've if you've got a family carer um, picking up some of the care, particularly if it's significant, to just let them keep doing it. I mean, my council never asks me that question about whether I'm willing to continue. It's always assumed, um, which it shouldn't be really. Mm -hmm. Now, we've sort of had this idea, Clinton, of putting people in the driving seat of their own care and support. So again, we've already got 
you know, some elements of this perhaps, uh, you know, certainly that was the, the vision behind some of the self-directed support. Where have we gone wrong? What's, what's it gonna take to uh, really make that a reality for, for everyone of all ages and all capacities, which I think is, is, is a challenge? I think that the, the biggest challenge is around uh, the first R that you introduced and what the report talked about, uh, looking at uh, rethinking uh, attitudes to care and support. One of the biggest uh, elements is our understanding and the public's understanding. And when we say uh, increase uh, uh, and rethink the, uh, the public attitude, that includes, for me, policymakers, it includes politicians, it also includes councillors and us ourselves as individuals, as the public, but we often see them as separate. They're all intertwined, and that's why, for me, it's un understanding what needs to be in place to enable us to flourish. We, you know, because flourishing will mean different things to different people. Let's start with that uh, bigger understanding. And like uh, Kate mentioned about um, the CARE Act, the CARE Act talks about uh, um, promoting, uh, you know, well-being. But we, you know, it's already on the statute that individuals' well-being should be at the, the forefront. So, you know, it's about making that a reality, you know, for, uh, and how equity you know, when we talk about fairness, how that plays out, because uh, everybody's starting point well, is at a different uh, uh, place. So the system um, works for some, but not for all. And, you know, there are sp um, spe uh, specific issues to uh, be addressed, whether that's for carers, whether that's, um, I was in a meeting uh, um, this week about, Aging uh, without um, uh, children. What does that mean when you know if we're constantly saying you know uh, where does uh, individuals, families, and friends? But if you you know you have no children, what does that mean for uh, the system? So the, the big conversation for me needs to take place so we can see what the, the bigger picture is when we talk about flourishing because. For me, flourishing is tied with the flourishing of others. We're not an island. And I, I thought that was so great about what came through in our discussions was the the interdependence, you know, so not, not to knock the very important sort of discussions and, uh, the, and, and campaigning that's happened for independent living and for independence. But I think that putting alongside that, that recognition that we are interdependent and um, I think the, this, the relational aspect of care and, and mutuality, I think um, was a really sort of strong part, wasn't it, of what, what, what we were trying to convey. I know that we had a bit of discussion, you brought up fairness there about rights, Clinton, and about, um, you know, we make some recommendations in the report about how do we sort of make strengthen those rights and entitlements. Obviously, there are already some entitlements. Uh, they're poorly delivered. And I think we make the point that it's all very well, you know, making people more aware of their rights. But actually, you've also got to give the, the duty holders, the people who are responsible for delivering those rights, whether it's local authorities or, you know, social workers, uh, the resources to do that. So um, how are you sort of feeling about the role that rights will play in this redesigned system? Rights will play a, a, a really important uh, part, but we need to realise when we talk about rights and entitlements, the social care isn't built on rights. Social care is built on entitlements. So, but rights is where a government or the state cannot take that away. Entitlement is built on a criteria uh, that is set by the structures and systems and services that we have in society under uh, social care. And we need to, for me, is to assess whether those systems or services is fit for purpose. 
And it can be complex, but it uh, helps to start by asking uh, uh, questions. And some of the questions I feel we haven't really asked is, which communities are served and which aren't and why? Uh, who gets to participate and who doesn't and why? I don't think we've really uh, uh, um, unpicked that. And the other for me, who has access to the resources and support, who doesn't and why? And then the last one for me is um, the co-production element. Whose voices get heard and whose don't and why? Mm. It's a bigger conversation. And I think that's what the report for me speaks to. That's the unrelated stories that need to be unpicked around those four questions that I've put. Mm. Thank, thank you very much. So coming back to you, Kate, um, obviously um, we talk in the report about trusting people, um, also trusting family members who may be in a position like yourself where um, you're not only caring for, but obviously advocating for, I think, your daughter to you know, ensure she gets the care that she needs. What could a redesign system look like there in terms of trusting and, uh, you know, you and, and, and your daughter uh, and, and enabling you to have more say? Yeah, I mean, trust is a really big issue for me. Um, I think often professionals will take their, the opinions of peer professionals rather over the, the views of um, family carers. So for me, it's, it's understanding and recognizing that um, people who know and care about people who draw on support know what matters to them. Um, mm -hmm. So the system needs to listen a lot more. Um, and actually just listening <laughs> a lot more would be a really good start. Um, and yeah, I think as Plenty says, if they did that, um, then we would see co-production. Um, more as the default way of working so whether that's individual level sort of co-creating lives um, that work for people um, or if it's thinking more sort of strategically about services um, you can't do it unless you work in co-production with with people and if you do you'll get far more creative solutions better solutions more options for people which is what we we desperately need but if i just go back a minute to what you were saying earlier about entitlements and rights mm. and stuff and um and the report does talk about this one of the things that concerns me is that there are lots of people who are excluded from care and support because they don't meet the criteria of the legislation so their needs aren't like high enough um but if those people don't have some care and support then they're more likely you know to um to need more care and support in the future. So for me, um, when you talk about the people who are excluded, it's those people with more moderate, um, more moderate needs. And I think that's really where communities can mm -hmm. play a much bigger role. And you know, it would be really fantastic if, if uh, local authorities and health authorities and government invested more in communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I mean, it's great that, that that really resonated with you because obviously it was a church sponsored commission. So we did, you know, show a particular interest in the role that church and faith communities, but the wider community, both informally and formally, and I guess, you know, through voluntary and community sector play. And I think it really struck us that where we met some local authorities that we genuinely saw the value in that and were investing in it. Um, that exactly it, it, it could enable people it was that sort of preventative you know enable people to to live well for longer um, in in community um, but we also I think felt that there was a really valuable role for community even when people perhaps had more complex needs and were living in a more specialist setting that they shouldn't be segregated and that they should still have all the opportunities to engage in community um, whether that was through people coming in or them um, going out um, and, and, and taking part in things and enjoying being part of their community. So um, I think hugely valuable. And, and in fact, I think that's the area where we think that this that we should be most generous in terms of it should be a universal offer of support to anybody. 
Um, yeah. So, you know, take away almost all the criteria for that in terms of any means testing or any um, need level and just recognize that actually um, you should have a very open front door, uh, I suppose, to care and support, which is is is, is in every community. Um, um, there are examples of those. So um, th thanks for that, Kate. That, that's, um, I don't know, Clinton, if you want to pick up anything about this sort of role of community um, that Kate's raised. I th for me, community, um, one of the biggest issues uh, for communities we've had, because of the pandemic, uh, the infrastructure that used to be there to help and support isn't there. So there has to be a, um, a, a political will and, uh, um, and from system leaders to create the infrastructure that enables uh, communities to contribute, to, uh, um, you know, connect relationships, you know, to, to live a, a life with meaning and purpose. You know, how does, um, you know, when we talk about social care, how does housing, what, you know, uh, mm. housing, uh, plays a big part, you know, green spaces play uh, a, a big part, you know, um, education, uh, good jobs, all of that. So for me, the, this is where I think it's really uh, important where we've mentioned in the report, uh, the National Care Covenant, and it's about what is the agreement look like? What is the responsibility of individuals and uh, uh, families, but also politicians, policy makers, and all in this big uh, uh, conversation that we need to have? And picking up on the, um, the part of listening, one, uh, one of the things that we need to ask ourselves, I constantly hear um, people who draw on care and support say, they want the system to, uh, to, to listen to our stories and, and be heard. The system, um, when we talk about systems, systems are people, but also when we took um, what it feels like for people who draw on care and support, when we, uh, they are being listened, sometimes it feels like they're listening just uh, to reply, but not really thinking about listening to respond to the actual context and situation that people are telling them about their lived experience. I think that's brilliant. Listening to properly to respond, not just to reply. So I think there's been a lovely theme of our conversation actually is, is about listening and it's at the heart of co-production, I suppose. Um, also shift in power perhaps that you know we, we've also touched on. Uh, maybe in our conversation about trust, you know, that that's partly about letting go, isn't it, of, of, of power. Um, so I think it's been great to, to, to pick up and I hope that stimulated some questions from, from our audience. Um, the, in our sort of redesign the system, we did also, so we've, we've dealt quite a lot on those bits that are around the person and their carer, but as Clinton sort of raised, we also touch on the role of, of housing, how we redesign housing. Uh, how we uh, harness technology that might be something else uh, we want to think about um, about in the redesign system how do assistive technologies or other um, AI and other things en enable people um, rather than um, disempower them uh, and we talk about workforce roles and, and that might be just something um, I think Ian's going to come in and start posing us some of the questions you've been you've been putting but whether Kate before we do that just to touch on the sort of redesigning roles again from a sort of um, carer perspective is there anything um, I don't know if you employ PAs but you know what can we learn about uh, redesigning roles uh, for, for those who provide paid care um, okay yes yeah, so I employ three or three PAs for my daughter and um, I mean people talk about values based recruitment what, what really matters um, when I'm looking for somebody is that they, um, they have characteristics that support my daughter. So it's about personality and values. Um, so, you know, I want people who are chatty, people who are outgoing, people are going to be observant because she doesn't use speech to understand. And um, 
people who are sort of empathetic and kind, etc. So it's those it's the values based rather than looking for qualifications. I don't care if anyone's got any qualifications or not, um, because it's not going to impact on on their role with Maddie. So long as they can take her out, enable her to do the stuff that matters to her, stick up for her if they need to, um, then yeah, I, I'm far more interested in qualifications like um, can they cook healthy meals. <laughs> um can can they drive the car safely do they know about person-centered thinking um far more i'm not interested in you know the traditional um sort of moving helping people to move and um i don't know first aid and all the sort of generic stuff we get they're they're important but they're not everything that's brilliant yeah well i hope lots of people are listening who might have uh have the opportunity to act on that. Um, certainly, uh, we we had a good debate about sort of over professionalizing and and taking away from the from those sorts of qualities maybe rather than qualifications. Um, yeah. So yeah, good. It's, it's, I mean, it all comes down. So as a society, we value people if they make an economic contribution. We don't value people for who they are, what they bring, human relationships, um, how they make you feel. Um, you know people's general well-being mental well-being emotional well-being so often i think when you're looking at jobs we're valuing the wrong things just to uh, uh, to pick that up when we talk about uh, uh, the value and what we ascribe as value um if we if you just google uh, dog walker and look at how much a dog walker earns it can earn, they can earn up to 20 to 25 pounds what we pay for uh, um, care workers or personal um, uh, assistance is national minimum wage. So that there tells us what we value. So um, I would like the, the system to be more human and let's value the, the, um, the skills that um, Kate just mentioned. And the skills is the human skills. And we often refer to that as soft skills I totally disagree that those are soft skills. Those are human skills, and we should get behind them. We often focus on the, the skills of tasks. Yes, they could, we can learn that, but we should focus more on the, the human skills of you know, connecting, uh, relationship building. Those are what we often forget. Here, here. I can see a few hear hears in the chat, so hear hear from me too. Ian, what's been coming up in the chat? That's brilliant. It's a great, great discussion. Thank you. Um, if we've had lots of really um, positive reactions, responses in, in the chat, um, far too many that we can go through them all. Um, but I'm just going to pull out some, some key questions in sort of the 10, 15 minutes that, that we have left. Um, several people have, have sort of struck on the same point um, and are very supportive of the um, the values and the principles that, that underpin the report, but they're interested in, in action and how do we actually put this into reality? How does it become more than what's been before? Um, and, and several people have been asking around what kind of political support can the report expect? Um, it'd be good to know if there has been any reactions um, from politicians either within the government or the Labour Party and opposition parties and whether you feel that there's hope for optimism on a political front around these ideas. So I guess, um, Anna, if I come to you first, but then uh, Clinton and Kate, if you want to um, come in on that one. Yeah, so um, partly because we were delayed in launching the report from September when we were originally due, um, due to the um, late Queen's um, death, uh, we've actually had the opportunity to build up quite a lot of support for the report and briefing it to um, all, all political parties um, and including the now chancellor when he wasn't yet the chancellor. Um, so, um, you know, we, we've really, um, you know, tried to push this and, and recognise that it is a long term um, approach, you know, but that we would hope that if we go down the route of national care covenant, it's something that goes beyond the term of a parliament, it goes beyond any political party. Um, so, you know, we've had a, we, we, we've had a, a reasonably um, sort of positive response to, to, to some of those ideas and particularly about how we value families and, care and communities and make clearer our 
mutual responsibilities I, I think people people that has resonated I'd say there's been a re mixed reaction to you know universal entitlement and the idea that we should move it away from the very mean means test to something that's a bit more generous and universal I mean we've been very clear that that is a long-term goal and that you know it would it's political choice about how much to spend on social care we think more should be spent on care and support um, than is currently and uh, we recognize that it would be a significant investment and that we should look to how as a collective uh, we we do that but we argue that the costs already fall to people so I'd say um, you know in terms of that question about the sort of politics in terms of implementation um, obviously these webinars and working with partners is all very much about trying to embed the recommendations and 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 um, work with others to take take things forward and put them into practice so um, that is our intention and the Church of England has a number of recommendations uh, but we'll also be continuing to lobby and influence to make sure the report um, sort of turns into reality. Lovely. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Kenton and Kate, do you want to come in on, on the work of, of TLAP or also NCAG in terms of what in the report chimes with the work that, that you're all doing and we're all doing um, to try and turn this more from, from politics and into people's um, reality? Uh, from uh, uh, my point of view, what TLAP was trying to do, we are trying to, uh, um, we've always been looking at trying to reimagine self directed support and try and put that on uh, as the scaffolding to create the, uh, you know, uh, flourishing and uh, living the life you want. We have often been uh, talking about a life, not a service. You know, uh, it, it's it's in our DNA, in, uh, think local at first of all. So, you know, we're talking about self-directed support, making that happen. We also want to implement more, uh, making it real, and how we can use that as um, to not just short term, uh, uh, medium term and long term, but, you know, making it happen and stick. But there is that um, fundamental cultural culture change because we've been around for uh, a long, uh, you know, for a long time and making it real has been around for a long time. And that needs to, um, we need to weaponize making it uh, real that it becomes the default uh, setting within the system. Thanks, Kenton. I'm just conscious of, of the time. Kate, can I just direct a specific question to you um, that's come up? Um, so this is from Brian. He's asking how can communities be more involved in a co-productive way? So how, how do we get more community development, more neighbourhood and individuals engaged at that level um, to co-produce the changes that are can be required okay so there's something i think that a lot of um people could help with tomorrow on a very practical level and um that is creating spaces where people can come together because if you're going to involve communities and co-produce it's all about people getting together and, and having conversations and um you know in the past i've asked places um community places have you got a room that people can use for free? And they all look horrified because everybody wants to charge 30 pounds an hour for a room. So um, that I'd just put that out there to local authorities, to churches, to mosques, synagogues. If you've got a place where people can get together, how can you open them up and invite people in? Um, and, um, and then it's... Um, yeah it's it's sort of maybe having sort of different things for people to talk about so how can we be more inclusive and um for me i think we've all got a responsibility to enable people who currently draw on services to be in their communities so my daughter maddie she only goes to like a specialized service for four hours a week the rest of the time she's out and about with everybody else but a lot of people aren't they're shut away in day services or residential care or wherever so I see it's my responsibility to get her out and connected to people and services need to do that as well they could start doing that tomorrow um I think um I just think there's loads of opportunities from this report 
Anna, any, any reflections in terms of, because it's, it's a Archbishop of Canterbury's commission, um, the contribution that the church, but also other faiths can play as part mm. of that wider community approach um, to really have real good quality, deep conversations yeah. Yeah. and turn that into action? So, I mean, I think one of the things we wanted to happen is already happening, which was that the Church of England show moral leadership and basically take this debate out to a much wider audience. And, you know, it's not every day you get the Archbishop of York on Good Morning Britain chatting to Ed Balls. So, you know, um, <laughs> I think that, you know, some of this was about them championing care and support talking about it differently so we've tried to put some of the language that we want to see in that attitudinal shift into their the way they're speaking about it and and obviously we're cascading this through church um networks but we also had a interfaith uh, dialogue both during the commission and actually this week uh talking to leaders of other faiths um about them doing the same um, so, so, and also, you know, both recognizing the important role that local church and faith communities play, but then committing to equip them, uh, equip them in the right way, because we also recognize that sometimes that charitable doing to others, you know, is, is part of the problem. So how do we equip them to understand that sort of opportunity of, of asset based or co-production? with people in their communities as to what do they want. Um, so I think there's lots of, of, of ways in which um, faith communities can play a stronger role and, and I think are already you know, up, up for that. So um, yeah, hopefully that can, uh, in a way, you know, the public attitude, well, if we start with everybody who's involved in the faith community up and down um, the country, that's quite a lot of people uh, whose attitudes we, we want to, ch to change. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. Um, we've got a question here from, from Rich, um, who's asking about, um, are there any recommendations of how we get local authorities to comment on the report? And I guess beyond commenting, how they get behind the, the values and the principles. Yeah. So we're certainly seeing a, a change within TLAP in terms of an interest from local authorities and, and regional way that is around making it real as, as a way of opening up the conversation and exploring what's going wrong, but also looking what's really strong. Um, and what can we start to build on and, and use as a basis for co-production conversations? So do you see any um, opportunities? Um, this is open to, to all three of you for using this report, maybe using the House of Lords report that talks about very similar themes, social care futures vision and TLAP's making it real to really begin to set a different conversation discussion with local authorities. From my point of view, I am, um, you know, with my uh, copy of uh, uh, the, the report, I would ask all, all the public, go and see your councillor your, uh, and bring it up, bring it up in, in their surgeries that you want to bring this attention to uh, have a wider platform in the political agenda. I think that's a great suggestion. Obviously, we're um, engaging quite a lot with through the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services. Um, also, I spoke with principal social workers this week. I also been busy week. Uh, did a, a, a session with LGA, so that had political officers and chief execs on the call, as well as uh, people who might have direct responsibility for social care. So, you know, care and support is a huge part of local authorities' budgets. Um, so, it's a top political for you know, as Clinton says, lobby your councillors, find out who is the you know, um, the lead on the cabinet, if you, you know, in terms of political people, make them know that you care and other people in your area really care about this and want something done differently because they then hold the officers, uh, you know, the directors of adult social services and others to account for how they're doing this. Um, so I think that is, is really good. But yeah, I, I think they're receptive. The fact is there are some local authorities who totally get this, certainly their leaders do, um, I think sometimes there's a bit of it getting lost in translation and I think some places just don't have this culture uh, and it needs a bit of a culture change but it's great that you know you're doing work um, social care futures have got a community of practice so you know direct your people as well that you know in your area to say how why don't they join one of these uh, you know groupings community of practice or um, I know that NDTI run a, a community-led support group. There's loads of networks where they can learn about this and share, you know, good practice. 
So um, we're really hopeful that by pushing this, you know, it's it, through those sorts of networks, um, we can get more local authorities to take this on. There's nothing stopping them doing quite a bit of this now. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, um, Anna. Um, and there's a very general question. Um, and I guess it talks about the, the process of change. Um, it's probably a good one to end on is, is when do we think or want the vision to become a reality? Uh, so Kate. Well, you see, I'd say 20 years ago, um, <laughs> you know, which is, I do feel we've gone backwards since, um, since we had value in people, we've taken steps forward and, and more steps back. So um, I, for me, it's, it's really urgent because we've got many people who are literally suffering um, because they haven't got the care and support they need at the moment. Um, and many people who don't have lives that aspire. Um, the whole issue of aspiring to be a, a sort of full human being doing what everybody else does, you know, having a good life, that's really been missing. So, yeah, it needs to happen tomorrow, Ian. <laughs> it's great. Clinton? Uh, I would just say now, um, uh, as the House of Lords report uh, stated, I just want a glorious, ordinary life, and I want that now. Thanks, Clinton and Anna. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was I was minded to say yesterday, you know, it, 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 this is overdue. It's 30 years overdue. There's been, you know, report after report and promise from politicians to fix social care. It hasn't happened. Um, you know, this is urgent. But on the other hand, we have set this out as something that may take 10 years in reality for all parts of it, because some parts of it are relatively radical in terms of and relatively expensive to move towards a universal entitlement. But there's lots of it that places are already doing, uh, you know, in terms of local authorities. Some providers totally get this. Some individuals do experience that um, self-directed support and feel empowered and supported. So, you know, it is possible now, uh, lots of this. So let's try and make it a reality for as many people as possible as soon as possible. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to end it there. But just to say that everybody's comments and, and links and reactions will be captured and recorded. And we'll make sure that we, we cover those in the subsequent days and weeks in terms of blogs and information that we can send back out to you. Um, just to say that from today's event, you will get a video recording um, of the session. Um, and um, We'll make sure everybody has a, a copy of the report and we'll make sure we, we send some links because as Anna was saying, this is stuff that can be done now and we know it can be done now because there are examples and evidence of people doing something different, doing something better, putting some of these ideas into practice. This isn't new, it's just not common, it's not widespread. Um, and there are some examples that we can also um, share through networks like TLAP and, and um, Social Care Futures and, and others. Um, so it's really to take heart and that really that the, the basis of this and the basis of making progress and change here is to have conversations. So webinars like today are good and, and great, but take those conversations elsewhere and um, take them into your own families, take them into your workplace, take them, as Clinton was saying, in terms of your, your councillors and your MPs. And really it's down to people um, to make the difference and take the actions. If we want people to flourish from the care and support system then that's down to everybody um, and it's about making sure that individuals can flourish that communities and neighborhoods can flourish that our workplaces can flourish and that our workforce can flourish as well um, and that's not going to be something that's going to have one answer it's going to be multiple answers it's not something that's going to happen everywhere overnight but it is stuff that we can make a difference tomorrow um, so thank you very much for all the guest speakers Thank you very much for everybody who's, who's taken the time and the interest to sign up and, and participate um, so fully in, in the chat and discussion. Um, and if one thing comes from the Archbishop's uh, report, it's that keep the momentum going, keep the focus on making things better and, and keep the conversation going because it's through that that we're going to see the changes that we all hope to see um, sooner rather than later. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>